In section 10.3, we're going to take a look at space curves again, and we're going to look at two aspects of them that we can measure. One is arc length, and the other is curvature. Uh, now, arc length is something that you've actually worked with in Calc 2. Um, you would take functions and find um, the arc length um, uh, of a curve in two dimensions um, in that class. And so we're going to just kind of continue on with that. I'm going to um, explain how we arrive at the formula we do kind of from first principles but if you went back and you know looked at your um, calc 2 notes um, or your calc 2 uh, textbook you would you would see a very similar derivation to what I'm going to show here so when it comes to looking at arc length we are basically going to do what's in this picture here so if the if the blue curve there is the uh, is, is the curve itself, then we're going to approximate the arc length by making a whole bunch of little line segments. Okay, and I'm going to actually pull up a, an illustration of this, and this is just kind of a Calc 2 type illustration, just 2D, but it's the same exact principle. So if I have this black curve here and I want to estimate its arc length, if I just draw a line from this beginning point to the end point, I get a pretty terrible um, approximation of arc length, but it is an estimation, right? But if I say instead, let's go ahead and use two line segments, obviously that gets better, right? And the idea is if I just continue to break up the number of, or continue to use more and more little points to connect up lines with and use more lines, then the more I do that, the better the approximation becomes until you use so many that then you can't even really distinguish between your little line segments and the actual curve anymore. And so this should be very accurate here. And so we're going to do that. And then, of course, what do we do in calculus? Once we get an approximation process actually set up, that's when we go and apply the ideas of limits um, that will allow us to move from approximations to exact. So what we're going to do here is understand that First of all, each one of these line segments to get the length of this segment from this point to this point is just going to be the distance formula. So if on this picture then I go ahead and draw a couple of dots, right? This dot would be maybe you know the first XYZ ordered triple that I'm interested in, and we could call this one X1, Y1 z1 this one and you get the idea here so i'll continue on but we just label these points then to find the distance from any two points on here um bet or between any two points on here we're just going to do the distance formula so this xi minus xi minus one might be like x2 minus x1 right and you square that y2 minus y1 squared c2 minus c1 squared added together, take the square root, that's the distance formula. Now for shorthand, we're going to use the um, notation delta xi, right? So the change in x, the change in y, and the change in z, just to kind of clean it up a little bit. So what we see is that once we have a given breakup of our curve, then we can get the approximate length by just adding up all these little distance formulas. Okay, and so that's what that's telling us. But now what we're going to do is we're going to move to this idea that whenever we have a curve, we tend to express it parametrically, right? So in general, we say that r of t is equal to this vector f of t, g of t, h of t, right? So we have a function for the x, y, and z components. All right. Now, if we break down what the derivative of each of these little functions are, right, f prime of t would be approximately the change in x over the change in t, right? It's telling us how is the x component changing as t changes, right? Same with g prime of t with delta y over delta t and h prime of t delta z over delta t. And so with those realizations, what we see is that this delta x that we see up in this formula is just f prime times the change in t, delta t, right? Same thing with delta y is g prime delta t, delta z is h prime delta t. 
And so what I can do is take this formula that we have up here and replace all the delta x, y's, and z's with f prime, delta t, g prime, and h prime. So I've just made that substitution based on that um, observation. And then we do some algebra. Right? You can separate out the delta t's um, from the primes. You can then square uh, each individual one. And then since delta t squared is common to all terms, you can pull it out. And then finally, delta t is always going to be a, a positive value, so we can pull that out of the square root as just delta t. And so we have the sum of the square root of the square of f prime plus the square of g prime plus the square of h prime, all under the square root, and then delta t on the outside. But this should start to look a lot like just a Riemann sum, right? You've got delta t, you've got a summation. So if we go to the next page here, we might ask, well, what happens then if we take a limit? So if we take the limit as n goes to infinity, um, or in other words, so what does that n going to infinity mean? Remember, n was the number of line segments that we're using to um, try to measure our curve with. So if we let the number of line segments go to infinity, then we get this expression here. And that should give us our true length. But we know that when we set a limit as n goes to infinity in front of this summation, it turns into an integral. And the delta t turns into dt. And so what I have here is um, this f prime. And oh, well, I, I see I do have a typo in here. Boy, I didn't even notice this. Sorry, this, this, and this should just be t. So let me just kind of correct this. So please correct this in your notes because I think copy and paste got the better of me here. So this should be f prime just of t, no ti, right? That's gone once we get the integral in there. Okay, and then instead of saying f prime, g prime, and h prime, we could also write it as just dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt. All right. Now what is this though, right? Remember that r prime right, of t is dx dt, dy dt, dz dt, or if you prefer, f prime, g prime, h prime, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to understand that what we see here is just the magnitude of this vector. So for real shorthand, what we can say is that the length of our curve is just the integral of the magnitude of r prime integrated with respect to our parameter t. All right, so let's do an example where we put this formula into use. So it says find the length of the curve with vector equation r of t is equal to t, t cosine t, and t sine t from the origin to pi negative pi zero. All right, now looking back here, understand that this integration is giving us values of t to integrate over. So when they ask us to go from the origin to a particular point, we first need to determine what is the t interval that that happens over. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we're going from the origin, right? Zero, 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 two here. Okay, so we need to know what is a equal, right? What is b equal? All right, now what we can do pretty easily if we look at this, I think it's clear that this should correspond to t equals zero. If I plug zero in for t, I get zero in the x, y, and the z. That's not a big mystery. But what we do need to do now is figure out what should, um, what should this, uh, what should the 
value of t should this be? So we are going to set t equal to pi. Okay. Well, it seems like that's our answer, right? Uh, that t should equal pi. Let's make sure that it works for the others. So if I put pi here and the cosine of pi, that's pi times negative 1, which is negative pi. Okay, so that checks out for the y value. And then if you put pi times the sine of pi, we know that the sine of pi is 0. So that's 0. So t equals pi is the proper b value. So we could say that a should be 0 and b should be pi. All right. So we're going to say that the length is the integral from 0 to pi. All right. But now we need to figure out what is r prime of t. That's what we're going to have to put in there, right? So r prime of t then is going to be 1 in the x component. But then in the y component, we've got to be careful here, right? So don't forget, we've got a t here, and then we've got a cosine of t. So this is going to require the product rule of s, right? So the derivative of the first times the second, and then plus the first times the derivative of the second, which would be negative sine t. And then here we're going to have derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So to clean this up a little bit, this will be 1 cosine of t minus t sine of t and then sine of t plus t cosine of t. Now, of course, what we need to integrate is not just r prime. We need to integrate the magnitude, which is good because we haven't, uh, you know, we, we want this to be a number, so we don't want to end up um, with a vector answer, right? We want a numerical answer, right? So we don't really want to stick a vector in there. The magnitude will, of course, be, it'll be a function, but it'll represent a number. So we'll take the magnitude of r prime. It's going to be 1 squared plus cosine t minus t sine t squared plus sine t plus t cosine t squared. All right, so <clears throat> this is going to require some simplification of this. Hopefully this will collapse down into something a little bit more friendly. So we have 1 plus, now i got to foil this out, right? we got to be careful about this. So we're going to have the cosine squared t. As a middle term, we'll have minus 2t cosine t sine t. And then we'll have plus t squared sine squared t. And then I've got to foil this out as well. And I can already see I'm starting to run out of room. So I guess this will be a little hokey, but do something like this, plus sine squared t plus 2t cosine t sine t plus t squared cosine squared t. All right, now what we can see is some stuff definitely cancels, right? I've got this one and this one are identical, but opposite signs. Um, and then I have some more nice stuff that happens here as well. So if I take my cosine squared t and sine squared t and put them together, we recognize the Pythagorean identity. That's going to equal 1. And then with these two terms, I could factor a t squared out of them. So I factor out my t squared, and then I get sine squared t plus cosine squared t. So another equal to 1 Pythagorean identity. So 
this thing turns into the magnitude of r prime of t is just equal to, we got one plus one plus t squared. So this is the square root of two plus t squared. So that's what I'll put up here. The square root of two plus t squared dt. And this looks simple enough, um, but it also is one that um, just finding the antiderivative is a little tricky. So we're gonna go to the table of integrals here. Um, and so what we'll just note, let me do this in a different color here, is that based on the table of integrals, it tells us that the square root of a squared plus u squared du, that's supposed to be equal to u over two square root a squared plus u squared plus a squared over two natural log of u plus the square root of a squared plus u squared. Okay, plus c of course. All right, so that's what, what you see when you look this up in the uh, table of integrals. Let me fix that real quick. So we're gonna apply that uh, to this here because that's what we've got, right? So for us, we can see that a squared equals two and so therefore a equals the square root of two. And then of course u is just equal to t. So what we get here is t over two square root of two plus t squared plus two over two natural log of t plus the square root of two plus t squared. And we're evaluating that from zero to pi. So of course we can plug uh, pi in all these places here. So we've got um, pi over two square root of two plus pi squared plus, that's just one, so I'll, I'll write that again, natural log of pi plus the square root of two plus pi squared. So that's me just plugging in pi. We gotta plug in uh, zero now, but of course that's gonna zero out this entire thing. And so we're gonna be left with minus the natural log of zero plus square root of two plus zero squared. So that's just the natural log of the square root of two. So what we get here is this is approximately 6.95, okay? So we're saying that the length of this segment between these two points is about 6.95. And so uh, let's just take a quick look at this in a grapher. So we'll type in our space curve here. And so we've got t, t cosine t, oops, lost my t there, and t sine t. Um, and then, yeah, first of all, kind of a cool shape there. Um, and then we're going from zero, uh, t equals zero to t equals pi. So let's go ahead and put in those values. All right, so there's our, there's our curve there. So the claim is that this is a length of about 6.95. And so if you take a look at the X and Y values, right, we're kind of going, this is going up to a height of two and then, um, and then side to side, maybe about a, you know, about three um, in the X and Y, both the X and Y directions. So to get a, um, a, a length of approximately seven, that, that seems pretty reasonable. We're definitely in the ballpark. So um, if there was some sort of error made, it's not a, it wouldn't have been one that threw off the answer too much. So I think we can feel pretty confident about the answer that we came up with. All right, so let's, 
On the next page, we have a kind of a lot of information here that is, um, uh, I guess, it, a lot of information that is uh, not really examples for us to do, but some just some things to understand. First of all, what I'm saying up here is that parameters parameterizations of curves are not unique. So let's let's take this example: cosine t, sine t, t, t going from zero to two pi. My claim is that if I wanted to instead of this equation going from t equals 0 to 2 pi, I could do this equation where I let u go from negative 1 to 0 and I would get the exact same thing. Um, and I could also do this one where I take the cosine of the natural log of v, sine natural log v and the natural log v and let v go between 1 and e to the 2 pi. And you can do a very quick justification to yourself of why this is, like for example down here, if you put a 1 into the natural log, you get 0, right? So that's going to be cosine of 0, sine of 0, 0, which is exactly what you get when you put 0 up here, right? And then here, if you put e to the 2 pi in here, you end up with the cosine of 2 pi, the sine of 2 pi, then the na uh, then 2 pi, which is exactly what you get there. So you can parameterize things in, in different ways and you don't change the curve itself. So, um, and again, going back here, if I were to graph what we were just looking at, the cosine of t, oops, cosine of t, got an extra t in there, the sine of t, and t, and we go from 0 to 2 pi, there's our picture there. It's a part of a helix. Um, but then what did they say? They said, what if we let this go from cosine of the natural log of t? I know they were using v in the notes, but Okay, and of course the reason it just blanked out on me is it doesn't like that I put a zero in the natural log, which it shouldn't like that. But if I change it to the values that it told me to, I get the exact same thing. The only difference here being that I need to make my discretization a little bit better um, in order to smooth out some of those corners. but but we, we get this right here, same exact picture. So the point being, you can parameterize things in all different ways and get this exact same curve. Um, so the fact that the parameterization doesn't matter allows me to come up with a function that gives us arc length, okay? So down here in this formula, the only difference between this and the previous page was Right here, this was an L for length, and then this was a B for the place we stop. But I can turn it into a function by putting whatever my parameter value is up here, and, and then going ahead and integrating, okay? And then it's dynamic. I can plug any value of T in I want, and what it will do is it will give me the arc length as a function of t, right? How, as a function of uh, how big my parameter value is from a starting point. Um, and if you want to think of t as time, think of it as it's a function of arc length. How far have you gone after a certain amount of time? Okay. Um, and then we can also see as well that because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? This should look familiar when you put your variable as the top limit of integration. Then whatever's in here is really your derivative. So we know that the derivative of arc length with respect to time is the magnitude of r prime. So this is this is an important principle here um, for us to remember that the change in arc length with respect to time is the magnitude of r prime. And then finally here, um, there's just a little comment down here that, and I'm not going to do this because it's not something I'm asking you to do in homework or on tests or anything, but what you can then do is 
um, and you can parameterize any curve by arc length. So in other words, instead of t um, being my parameter here, I could figure out um, what the formula should be where arc length is my parameter. So the idea then is after you've traveled a certain distance along your curve, where are you at? As opposed to after a certain amount of time where t goes by, where are you at? We're not going to do an example of that. I just want you to know that that's something